this episode, we're going to talk about the 5,000, a walk, and dirty hands. Here we go. Okay, in this episode, we're going to go back to the Gospel of John, and we'll go to chapter 6. And here, Jesus is in Galilee, and he goes off into a mountain. And remember, we're talking about, again, there's all this parallelism between Jesus and Moses constantly, but especially uh, in this time of Passover. So this is around the time of Passover, and so the themes that we see are very much about the Exodus And so Jesus goes out and he goes up into a mountain, uh, which would be a hill in Galilee. And there his disciples are with them and he's talking with them. And from all corners of Galilee, most likely, he gets this huge crowd of people that gather around him and listen to him. They just want to hear him talk. And here we have uh, in chapter 5, it says, When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So he's asking Philip, this is most likely around Philip's village. And so uh, he's asking him, and he's kind of leading him in this question, right? Well, what should we do? What do you think we should do here, Philip? And Philip says, you know, hey, we've got five loaves of barley and we have two fish. These would be pickled fish. And that's all we've got. And we've got a little bit of, we've got 200 pence here. That's not going to buy very much uh, if we went and bought any bread. So Jesus says, have the crowd sit down. And he takes the loaves and he takes the fish. And he himself distributes it, distributes the, the loaves of bread and the fish. And he feeds everybody with it, right? The miracle of the loaves and the fish. And they're all filled from this. And then He has them go around and gather whatever is left over afterwards. So in other words, there's plenty for everyone. That's the point of that, saying that there's there's something that is gathered afterward. Everybody is filled up. And then here, interestingly, in verse 14, it says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of truth that prophet that should come into the world. So this is a direct reference back to Moses and his prophecy of the Messiah. In the Old Testament, Moses talks about the prophet that will be coming into the world, specifically talking about the Messiah. So this is, again, a correlation between Jesus and Moses here in this example. Also to understand here would be that these are the loaves of bread that would be equivalent to the manna that fell from heaven for the Israelites in the wilderness. And then it says that the, of the remnants, there were 12 baskets that they filled up. Now, possibly, again, a, an allusion to the 12 tribes of Israel going back to the time of the Exodus and Moses as well. And then the men that are there say, is this the prophet that was prophesied to come into the world? This is another allusion back to Moses. Because Moses had prophesied about the Messiah, about what he called the prophet that would come into the world. So he's bringing that together again here. This is Jesus and Moses being coupled here together. And when they said this, then Jesus perceives that they are going to want to make him a king. So pretty interesting here that they would say that. That, again, we talk about the king of the Jews, that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Here there's already a reference to him as the king, as the Melchizedek. There is an example in the Old Testament when David brings the Ark of the Covenant from, I believe it was Shiloh, in to finally get that, that into Jerusalem. And he distributes the bread to everyone. Could be an allusion back to that as well. Kind of a temple-centered theme here and the Ark of the Covenant that uh, the Israelites carried in the desert as well. And then we move over to Matthew 14 to talk about Jesus walking on the sea. So they leave this area. Jesus has the disciples leave in a boat, and Jesus goes off to a mountain to pray. Again, another mountain where he's going to go up and pray. Another allusion to Moses. And they leave, 
and go out into the sea. And then in the middle of the night, Jesus comes out walking on the water. And the disciples are all afraid, thinking that this is a spirit of some sort. And Jesus says the following to them. He says, And Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Now, when he says it is I, the translated Greek on that is ego eimi, or ego eimi, which means basically the same term that he uses with Moses up on Mount Sinai, which is I am that I am. Same thing. It is I. And in fact, he uses this phrase several times throughout the New Testament. And so Peter answers him and says, Lord, if it's you, then bid me to come out to you. And so he does. And so Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking on the water just like Christ. I see a lot of lessons learned here in in this example. Um, He goes out, he walks on the water just as Christ is walking out on the water for maybe a few steps, maybe more. And then he looks around him, he sees the storm, the wind, the waves, and he starts to doubt. And so he starts to sink. And of course, what happens at that point? He says, Lord, save me. And immediately, the Savior reaches out his hand and grabs Peter and saves him. So this is a great story, a great example of of a great experience that shows us a number of different lessons. First, I would say Peter has the faith. I mean, he sees the Savior out there, and he has enough faith to try. I think that's important. He wants to be like the Savior. The Savior is the, has the ability to do this, and now Peter wants to be able to do it as well. So he's reaching up to the Savior. He's trying to be like him, and he's exerting the faith that allows him to start moving toward Christ like we all are trying to do. And so he's exerting enough faith to start taking these steps. So we can think of the sea, in a sense, as a spiritual walkway, not as a, or a, 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 a spiritual road and not a physical road, where we go out, we step out of the ship of the world, and we are going to try and step on this new road, this new spiritual path that leads us to Christ. And we have enough faith to maybe get started with that and to try and become more like the Savior and to move toward him. And then as we go and there are distractions in our lives and there are threats and there are obstacles and, and, and the, the adversary works on us, we start to doubt Can I really keep walking toward him? Can I really do this? Do I really want to? And take our eye off the ball, and we start to sink. And then here, Peter, this may not be the case for everyone, but here Peter, as he starts to sink, he says, Lord, save me. And so here he gives the example of the Lord, in the end, saves him. So he has the faith to move forward, but he doesn't have the perfection to make it all the way to Christ on his own. He has to rely on not just his own faith, but he has to rely on the Savior or have faith in the Savior to be able to save him at the end. And so that's kind of the example that we all, of, of all of us, we're all Peter. Most of us that would listen to this podcast probably have had enough faith in their lives, at times at least, to take a step out of the ship and to start moving toward Christ. But most of us also, at least in one degree or another, have probably started to sink a little bit and are bothered by distractions or threats or whatever it might be. And hopefully we have or will reach out to the Savior and ask him to help us and to save us and to help us get all the way to him. So then they all arrive at the other side of the shore. The people are a little confused as to how Jesus got there because they know that 
the disciples had left in the boat by themselves from where they were all fed and that Jesus had gone off on his own. So they can't quite figure out how it is that he got over uh, across the Sea of Galilee to them as well. But Jesus says, look, the reason you're looking for me is because you want me to feed you. Remember, they wanted to make him a king because they had, they, he had fed them all and had all these miracles. But that was the whole point of what he was saying here, uh, is that manna from heaven is, is going to sustain you physically. The bread will sustain you physically. But if you're back here again because you want me to sustain you physically, you're in the wrong place. This is the whole point. And he says to them, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Now, we use the word meat. Uh, I know at least in the book of John, the, the, the term here is basar, the Hebrew is basar, which is meat or flesh. It also, by the way, interestingly enough, is the word used in Isaiah 52, 7 which is how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those or he that bringeth good tidings or the gospel, good news, which is a reference to the Savior. And the good tidings is actually Basau. It is actually who brings flesh, who brings the meat or the fruit. And so this is a reference, I think, also in a way, tying back to Isaiah here a little bit. This is who the Savior is. He's the one who is bringing the bread, the meat, the flesh. And, of course, he talks about the flesh of his own body as representative of the meat. And he continues and says, Which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And he says, Our fathers, going back to the example of the Exodus, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. This is down in 31, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So again, it's the higher and the lower law here. Trying to get them out of the idea of the manna being what physically sustains you, to the manna or the bread of life. Jesus being the bread of life is what is going to sustain you. Move beyond the physical world here and think of the spiritual world. And it is the atonement, it is me, says Jesus, that is going to sustain you. If you can have faith in me and not in physical bread and not in Moses, (laughs) but actually have faith in the atonement and in the Messiah which I am, he says. And so the people respond and said, Lord, give us this bread that gives us life. Give give us this bread. And he says in 35, I am, again, ego aimi, or aimi, I am that I am, the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Okay, so a couple things here. We can go back and, and... See a couple of parallels here. First, we can go back to the woman at the well where the Lord says, I am the living water. We talked about that and the the streams coming out from Eden and from the idea of coming out from the temple. He is the living water here. He is the living bread. He is the bread of life. But remember, this is the time of Passover and these are themes of Passover. And so... With those themes, he's talking about manna, and he's talking about water. And the water would be the water uh, that was, uh, the, the, w- the Red Sea that was parted. And then, of course, the water, when Moses struck the rock with his, the staff, the water that came forth from there into 12 streams. So that is also what is being talked about here. That is constant throughout the New Testament. It is this comparison between Moses and Jesus. And if we look for that often, you're going to see that he's trying to elevate the people into this new line of thinking. They are stuck with Moses, right? Moses to them is the highest. 
So he's trying to move them beyond that and say, look, what Moses was about was looking forward to me. Right? We don't stop there. He was, he was looking forward to me, and that's what the law of Moses really is about. And I am now here, and I am bringing you the fullness of the gospel, which is the spiritual side, the Melchizedek priesthood, all of the temple ordinances. And he's bringing this comparison in constantly. He follows that up when 49 was saying, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. In other words, the manna that they ate kept them alive in mortality. It did not keep the, give them eternal life. Right? This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Talking about himself. So then we get a foreshadowing of the sacrament. We have Jesus then where he's talked about the manna and he's walked on the water. We have these two examples here of the Passover uh, where they're associated with the law of Moses. Jesus now takes that and raises it up to the higher law. And he says the following. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. So his sacrifice, uh, his body, is what he is going to give for the life of the world. Right? That's the true manna, in a sense. That's what's going to sustain, help sustain us spiritually. And they, the Jews said, well, how, that are there, I said, how can, how can he give us his flesh to eat? They don't understand what he's saying. But before I go on to the next part on this, think about the sacrifices that are made in the Law of Moses that look forward to the sacrifice of, of Jesus. That is that they would make the sacrifice of the animal and they would all partake of that animal as well. They would burn, have a burnt offering, basically barbecue the, the animal on the altar and then the priest would eat of it, uh, the family would eat of it that brought the sacrifice and they would partake of the, of the, of the flesh of the animal. And that was part of them internalizing, par partaking of the sacrifice as well. Right? They, were, they were partaking of it as well. And that's what Jesus is, is kind of talking about here, I think, because he is the sacrifice. He is the final sacrifice. And then he also says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. So he's saying that he is the sacrifice. He is the final sacrifice that all these other sacrifices are actually looking forward to. So the sacri Jews, these sacrifices that you are making now are supposed to be looking forward to me and to my final sacrifice. And just as you would partake of those, in a sense, you will be partaking, you need to partake in my sacrifice as well and have faith in it and, and uh, trust in my sacrifice. And a, a commitment to that, a representation of that would be eventually the sacrament where we partake of the bread and the wine or the water. We are, in a sense, partaking of his sacrifice, of his flesh and of his blood, of the lower law of, of flesh and the higher law of the blood, uh, where representations of the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood. But many of those that are there don't like what they're hearing. They don't, it's too much for them. They, and what I think is, is I don't think that they're just saying, how are we going to partake of his flesh and his blood? I mean, this is cannibalism. I think really maybe what they're thinking here is they don't like the higher law. I think that's what the pushback is here. We're not going to, you know, we have our sacrifices. They don't look forward to anything else necessarily. And we want to stick with where we're at. I think that's where they may have the harder issue here is understanding the higher law of what the sa all the sacrifices represent. They represent his sacrifice and the atonement and something spiritual. And this man here before them 
is going to perform this act by proxy on their behalf and be the sacrifice. And I think that's just too much for them to handle. And then lastly, we go to chapter 15 of Matthew. And here we have a, a, an interesting principle that comes up. And Jesus is contending with the scribes and the Pharisees here. And there are a couple of principles here that I find are, are pretty interesting. The scribes and the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say the following. They say, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Now here Matthew says specifically, he wants to make sure we the readers understand what is being said here. He says, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? It's not the law. It's not part of the law of Moses. It's the tradition of the elders. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. And he answered unto them and said, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So he inverts it. He flips it around. And he brings up this point. He says, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Okay. So one of the Ten Commandments, honor thy father and honor thy mother, right? And so what they're saying is with the elders, why aren't you following this tradition of, of our parents and their, their parents and their parents? And he's saying, well, wait a minute, well, you do not honor your parents. This is what he says. He says, but ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So in other words, there is a teaching here going on that basically says as children or as the children of whatever age, whatever has been given to you by them, by their teaching, by their goodness, by their sustaining you, whatever it might be, you look at that as a gift. And you're not honoring, actually honoring your father and your mother for everything that they've done. So there's something going on in the society here where there is maybe rebellion or disrespect, a lot of disrespect toward parents at this time. That's what it seems like to me. And he's saying, you don't even obey the commandment you're asking me about the tradition of the elders in washing hands, the tradition of your parents and their grandparents, and yet you don't even really honor the parents. And that's something you can't even honor. In other words, you're, you're being complete hypocrites here. And so he refers to them by using the words of Isaiah. He says, you know, Isaiah, which is Esaias here in, in Greek, Isaiah prophesied well of you in his time talking about you in our time. He said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So where else do we hear that? Of course, we hear that in the first vision. It's the same thing, where there's a lot of words that are spoken. There's a lot of honor that we can speak, right? But their hearts are far from me. It's the same description that was given to Joseph Smith when he was looking for the right church and, and what he should do, which church he should join. And he's told the same thing, right? There's, and, and we can see that, right? I mean, one of the principles that we learn here in the New Testament, again, is about you shall know them by their fruits. <laughs> I think that's a really important principle because whatever comes out of people's mouth is one thing, but the actual fruits that are born here in a religion and in, in a society can be something completely different. I mean, think of the Zoramites, for example, right? The Zoramites, everything was about what they said uh, up at the pulpit. Uh, uh, and, but nothing, you had the poor people outside that were waiting. There was the, the fruits that they bore were, were not good, but their words were great. What he says is that what really matters is what's coming out of you, right? It's not what you're, what you're eating, and wh whether your hands are clean or not. He's talking about what comes out of you. And he says the following. He says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. 
For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So again, higher law and lower law. The lower law, which the, the scribes and Pharisees are focused on here, is the actual dirt on their hands and not the dirt maybe in their minds or in their hearts that comes out through their mouth. And so that's the contrast that we have here. Being clean, basically, what he's saying has to do with your spirit and your mind and with your heart and not with your hands. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you.